trying to be Jewish or keeping the Sabbath and doing different things like that. You can do all of that, but it'll never get you into heaven. You can go down into a Baptist church, fill out a card, kneel at the altar, pray a sinner's prayer. Ask Jesus in your heart, stand up, shed a few tears, get baptized and start living the best you can with God's help. That righteousness will not get you into heaven. Everybody knows, even the rank of sinner, knows that it takes righteousness to get to heaven. But there are two kinds of righteousness. One kind will get you to heaven and one kind won't. Which kind do you have? I discussed that here. This is an old message we got from our archives. We pulled it out and think it'll be a great blessing to you. So look at this carefully. All right, I want to talk to you a little bit about something that uh, is most important to a number of you here, most important thing you can hear, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you know there's two kinds of righteousness? One of them will get you to heaven, and one of them won't. This gospel, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth. That's a big mouthful there. The power of God and unto salvation to everyone that believeth. About three weeks ago, I spoke in a, pre a street preacher's meeting to the street preachers, about 150 of them, and they had several people testifying. Had this old lady come up, <clears throat> I mean old lady, uh, come up and testify how she got saved on the street uh, 50 years ago, or something like that. Uh, she was out on the street in front of a skin flick, uh, one of the first uh, X-rated movies shown in Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, I got 40 people, and we went down there, and we lined up, created a second line as they were going into the theater, and we said to them, you're in the line to hell and we're in the line to heaven. Get out of your line and get in ours. <clears throat> now, that's kind of straightforward. But amazingly, a few of them would get out of their line and get in ours to hear what we had to say. There was this one girl that looked over, a hippie girl, skinny little thing, long blonde hair. She looked over at our line and she saw a guy she'd been smoking pot with two or three weeks before getting high and partying. She said, what are you doing in the line to heaven? And he said, come over and I'll tell you. Two weeks earlier, he was at the Memphis fair, the fall fair, where we had a booth set up giving people the gospel with 400 professions of faith. He was just one of them that we, you know, just one out of 400. And so he had hung around with us for the last couple of weeks and was there with us in the street preaching. She recognized him. She got out of her line into our line. She heard the gospel. I talked with her. A couple other people talked with her. And she got born again. You say, but can you, can you get born again just on the street in 20 minutes of conversation? Well, it's still working. Some 50 years later, she went home, told her husband who sent her down there to get her wired because he'd seen it the night before. And when she walked in, he looked at her and said, what happened to you? And she said, I met a man. He said, I knew it was going to happen. <clears throat> and she said, his name is Jesus. And he changed my life. And over the next several months, her husband got saved. Her brother got saved. Her mother, her father, her sister, uh, sister-in-law. Actually, those came to be nearly 40 people in her family, in her circle, who came to know Christ in the next year. That's the power of God to change your life. I remember when, uh, I, before I got married, I uh, built a kayak uh, 16 feet long out of three quarter inch sticks and canvas. And it, it, was just, it weighed about 15 pounds, the whole thing. I put a rudder on it and a sail and some lee boards to stabilize it, put it in the Mississippi River about two o'clock in the afternoon and a friend of mine, a guy in the military and I got in it with 300 pounds of gear and headed down the Mississippi river. Now it was in the fall long about early October, I guess. And, uh, as we got, uh, out in that water, I, <laughs> it's like this thing swallowing us up, this gigantic 
mile wide Mississippi River running 11 mile an hour current. And uh, we got ready to stop for the first night. I saw the sun to go down. I said, we better get ready to stop. But you know, you're, you're half mile out and you, you just don't land the next 10 or 15 minutes. It takes an hour and a half. It was nearly dark and we were coming in to some rock pilings there and riffraff they call it and moving 11 miles an hour you just don't stop a kayak and get out of it we'd never that was our test run so i saw a little in, inlet like that and just we started to pull in i heard this sucking noise and there was a hole about this big around sucking straight down the kind of thing that makes little boats like ours disappear it missed us about six feet we got in there pulled the kayak about eight or ten feet up on the bank tied it off up on these rocks at an angle like this and it started raining that night. Our tent soak fell in on top of us. Uh, we didn't get much sleep. It was about nine or 10 o'clock before we got out of the tent and everything was sopping wet. Went down there, the river had risen that night, banged our kayak, knocked a hole in it. We had uh, some patch kit. We patched it up, headed back down the river. We did that for five days. We had uh, adversity of one sort or another. We had tugboats pass on both sides, lift our kayak six foot in there and drop it. Wow, wham! I was thinking about every screw and drop of glue I put in that thing every time it banged like that. <clears throat> and finally, on about the fourth day, we uh, made camp. And that afternoon, we'd stopped on this big, long sandbar and had some Vienna sausage and crackers that were a little bit wet. And that was our, that was our meal. And uh, then we made camp that night and up in some trees on the side of the river. And I just got laid down good and it hit me. It's called the runs in Tennessee. And so I did, I ran and I was able to get, oh, maybe 125 foot away from the tent. And there I left a little white bundle of tissue marker and I went back in and said, man, that was rough. I'm glad that's over. About 15 minutes later, I did the runs again. This time, 125 feet. Next time, 100 feet. Next time, 190 feet. 180, 170, 160, five feet. And five feet is the last I got on that outside the tent. I was glad to get that far, you know. And, but by then, I was depleted. And so I lay down and slept. And my buddy woke me up the next morning. And I literally could not walk. I just could not walk. I couldn't help him load up and I drank what water we had and I just crawled down to the, to the, where we were going to get in the boat and get it all loaded up. And I sat in the back and operated the foot pedals. He sat in the front, and operated a little sail we had on the thing. And uh, we both had paddles. So we got out into the river and a, a storm comes up behind us blowing south, right straight down the river. We're headed down to the bridge at Helena, Arkansas. That storm picked up. We put that sail out, and I mean, we were slapping the water. We must, 11 miles an hour current, probably getting another 10 miles an hour. So, I mean, we were just flying. We started chasing ducks and stuff. We, we were going down through there, and I got to feeling a little better. And uh, so about six hours later, we saw the Helena, Arkansas Bridge. Man, we never so glad to see anything in my life. And there were a bunch of barges parked along the side. You, you, wouldn't, be, you wouldn't believe how barren the Mississippi River is. You don't see houses or stores or businesses or civilization it's just a wilderness when you get out there in the river and so we're going down through there and i see that bridge with these barges tied up against the side so i steer over close to them and the guy on top of one of the barges starts screaming at me get out of the river get out of the river and calling me some other stuff i can't repeat and about that time i heard mm -hmm. The foghorn at the, those tugboats going downstream, 11 miles an hour plus 11 miles an hour. And th the passage was between the pier of the bridge and the barges where he had to go. That's where the channel was and that's where we were. And he was coming down on us fast and hard. So I didn't wait. I just I saw these two barges end to end tied up. I told him when I tell you to paddle hard. I cut the rudder real hard on that thing. We both began to paddle just as hard as we could. And we slipped in right between the, where those two barges come together like this and just got just back uh, almost around it when the waves of that passing tugboat uh, and 40 barges tied to it uh, hit us. And we pulled around behind it, maybe six or eight feet between it and the, and the shore rocks there. And so we climbed out and the guy said, you can't, you can't get out here. This is not a public site. I said, it is today, this far as I'm going. And uh, so 
Uh, we, uh, we carried our kayak up the hill and up into their parking lot up there. And so uh, we said, let's go down, to the, uh, go down to the store and call someone to come pick us up. So we asked him, he says, about two blocks down, you'll find a business. So back then, no cell phones or anything. So we climbed to the top of the hill and started to walk. And here's this guy standing on the side of the road hitchhiking, a hippie back in those days, you know. And I said, man, have you, have you ever heard about Jesus Christ? You know who he is? He said, where'd you come from? I said, we just came from the river. His face got pale. He said, you came out of the river? How? I said, a boat. We came down the boat, got out of the river. I said, I wish I had a Bible. I could tell you, show you something. He goes in his duffel bag and he pulls out a Bible. He said, an old lady gave me this two nights ago in St. Louis. She said, somebody be coming to tell me about Jesus. And last night I had a dream that somebody came out of the river to tell me about Jesus. He said, I want to hear what you got to say. I gave him the gospel in about 10 minutes. He starts crying and rocking. We're sitting there on the side of the road. So I start crying, but I couldn't rock. I just jumped up and run up down the road this way, run back that way, went down the bank, came back up, shouting hallelujah. Now that guy got saved. He got born again. And we went down to make a phone call. We came back. He was gone. Uh, I got to thinking about that, how God's in charge of everything. We left Memphis five days earlier. We had adversity that stopped us. We had different difficulties and problems. Then we had, we must have gotten behind schedule. God sent a great north wind. <laughs> came pushing us down the river at full speed. And we'd have gone past those barges. We wouldn't have tried to land between them. But here comes this barge, which left sometime last night up in St. Louis or somewhere. And he's coming down the river, you know. And all that puts us right there. And this guy's hitchhiking. No one picks him up. He's there at the right five minute interval when we show up. And God had already started it two days ago with an old lady in St. Louis and a dream that night. And you know what I learned right there? I learned God's in charge. Now, it doesn't always happen that uh, <laughs> distinctly, but I just it stood out with me how easy God can save people. I remember I was uh, about, uh, Deb and I had just been married and I had a big black bushy beard and uh, I wore uh, old dirty t-shirts that usually left my belly button showing because I couldn't get them long enough and had on some cut off blue jeans and worn out tennis shoes. We lived in an old rental house, didn't have any insulation. And just next door to it was a house full of hippies. There was about eight or 10 of them lived there and they shacked up together. And so I heard them over there partying one afternoon. So I walked over and walked into the house where they were. And one of them said, hey man, it's cool. You want, you want a joint? I said, no, I already got something. He said, that's great, it's good, you know. And so he's stand up and he's making this lecture about politics or religion or something. I forget, don't remember what it was, but he's, people get high like that on pot and other things. They just, they, they feel intellectually <laughs> exalted and they feel in touch spiritually. And so they just like to expound on great, great deep truths. And they think they're making sense, you know. And so he, he talked and I sat down there. There was two, two girls that were in the conversation. Some others were back in the other rooms doing different things. And I just sat there and listened to him for about 20 minutes. Didn't say a word. After about 20 minutes, he said, what do you think? And I stood up. I said, well, I've been listening to you for 20 minutes. So sit down and I'll tell you what I think. He said, okay, cool, man. So he sat down. And I told him the story that I'm going to tell you. I just told it to him simply. I never told him he was lost. I never told him he needed to get saved. I never told him he needed to be born again. I just told him the story of Jesus. I told him the beautiful story of God creating everything because he wanted to fellowship. He wanted sons and daughters. He wanted family and friends. He wanted his table to be graced with people he could communicate. God wanted children. God loves children. Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not for such is the kingdom. And so God wanted to create something like himself and he did. He took his own image and he made something like him, something that looked like him, talked, smelled, touched, felt, and saw like he does. Something that was on a finite level scale of what was infinite in his attributes. So God created that first couple and he invented the 
male-female relationship, told them to be fruitful, multiply. God had great plans. Put them in a garden, planted a garden, eastward in Eden. Uh, told, said to no man to till the land. So God placed them there to take care of this garden. And God trusted them. He had faith in them. He trusted them with a free will. He trusted them with the ability to choose. And in order to give meaning to that ability to choose, not being any choices available to them, God gave them one choice. One thing that they could make a decision about. And that is don't eat of this tree. Don't eat of it. And the day you do, you'll die. That's all. Everything else was okay in the universe. Everything else, they could take anything they wanted. They could have anything. They could build anything, grow anything, eat anything. They could have their relationship together between them. They couldn't commit adultery or fornication. I mean, it was just the two of them living in a paradise. Of course, the hippies at this point said, that's cool, man. Yeah, two naked people living in a garden together, raising organic vegetables. I can get into that. <laughs> <laughs> You're not supposed to laugh at that. You're not old enough. <laughs> and so I told them about that. And then I told them how that though God had faith in them, they lost their faith in God. He told them not to touch it, not to eat of it rather. And they chose to eat of it. Satan came along, that evil one, the darkness came in and the darkness encompassed them and told them that God was holding something back, that there was an opportunity for them to know good and evil like the gods do. And that this tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, would make you wise. And see, Eve didn't want to do anything sinful. She just wanted to be smarter. She didn't want to do anything sinful. She just wanted to see things that are pleasant to the eyes. It's just something that tasted good. All very positive motivations. In fact, God created all those motivations and put them in Eve. He made her with a desire to see things pleasant, as we all do today. He made her with a desire to eat, to taste things that are good, as we do today. And he made her with a desire to grow in wisdom and to know and learn, which is what makes us invent and create. These were all good drives. But the devil gave her an opportunity to exercise those drives out of faith with God. That was the sin. Not the thing she did, but that she got out of faith with God in the act of doing them. She did them out of order at the wrong time in the wrong place. And when she did, she gave it to her husband. He ate and both of them had something die inside of them. Something that just wilted. Because up till then, the spirit of God had abided with their spirit. And now they were lonely because the spirit of God had departed. And now without God's fellowship or communion, late in the day, as God would come and walk with them, they hid from him because they didn't have faith in him anymore. And then I went on to tell them how the flood came and God destroyed the earth and and the God uh, through prophets predicted the coming of someone who would set all this straight. And then I told about how Jesus came, how he loved, how he died, how he bore our sins on his body. And how he was buried and raised from the dead and overcame sin and death. How he ascended into heaven and said, I'm going to go back and prepare a place for you that where I am there, you may be also. So God is making his family. He's gathering his children but there's only, only one thing God requires of us. And that is that we have faith in him once again. That we believe once again. That we join his team instead of the self-willed team. That we just enjoy his presence instead of hiding from him. That we look for him and worship him instead of hiding and living in self-indulgence. So God just asked that of us, a very simple thing, that we join his family once again, that we be adopted back in, having lost all of that. That's what he wants. And then I told them how that he's coming back on the clouds of heaven on a white horse and going to rapture us out and take us to a paradise. And those who don't know him and refused 
to believe him will be left behind and destroyed and they'll be put in hell. And then throughout eternity, there's going to be great joy, great celebration, dancing and music and living in great peace and happiness. And I said, and that's the story. And I walked out. I didn't say anything about getting saved. I just told them the story. The next day, young girl met me at the garbage can where we shared the common area where we dumped our garbage. She said, you messed up our house last night. I said, how's that? She said, we couldn't sleep together, the three of them. She said, we couldn't sleep together. I said, why not? She said, that story that you told us. I said, what story is that? She said, you know about Jesus and all that that Jesus did. You, you, you messed us up. And I said, would you like to get messed up some more? I'm going someplace tonight. Would y'all like to go with me in my fire truck? I'd bought an old fire truck and fixed it up, you know. And that appealed to these hippies. So we got in our fire truck, had all kinds of trouble with it. Thermostat quit working. The hood popped up on the bridge. We finally got back home. But I took them out that night, the next night, and went out to a place. And they heard the gospel, saw some people having joy. You know, uh, two of those young people went on to work in ministries of one sort or another. And one of them stayed a lesbian and showed up at our house about 10 or 15 years later with her lesbian lover. Uh, didn't take with her. But two of them got born again of those three that night with that simple gospel message. Now, let me ask you, have you been born again? I'm not saying do you live like a Christian. There's lots of people that are going to live fine lives that go to hell. And people that hadn't lived good lives at all, got saved, still didn't live good lives, and will go to heaven. There's going to be some honorary people that if I had a choice, I'd leave them out of heaven. But God's taken them in. You know why? Because they reestablished a relationship of faith with God. Weak in the flesh they may have been, but they loved God and loved holiness. They loved purity. And they came to walk with God and talk with God and know Him. Lives never got real clean. They'd have been shunned in an Amish community. They'd have been kicked out of a Baptist church, but they died and went to heaven. Because something happened in their heart and soul that God loved. Whereas there's people living extremely righteous, walking very circumspectly. God looks at them and says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. They'll be homeschoolers in hell. There'll be homeschooled parents in hell. And there will be street people in rescue missions and living in homeless shelters. They'll have the first place in heaven. You see, man looks on the outward. God looks on the inward. So what is your inward part? Paul said this, and be found in him in that day, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Jesus Christ. So there's two kinds of righteousness. One is the kind that you perform, that you do. Let me illustrate it this way. I've got a glove here. Let me pick up this glove. See, my work glove is my welding glove right here. So I say to this welding glove, pick up that tool. Nothing. Pick up the tool, nothing. Now that's, that's you and I trying to be spiritual, trying to do the right thing. So Roman Catholics teach that the way you get saved is that as a hand goes in the glove, you've got to have God come inside of you and give you strength to pick up the tool. So through communion and confession and other things that you do in the Catholic church, you receive grace of God inside to empower you to live the Christian life, which God then sees you living that Christian life and says, look, he has quit smoking. Look, he's quit watching pornography. Look, he's done all kinds of things. He's got, he's living the Christian life. I'm going to take him to heaven. That kind of righteousness won't get you into heaven. The kind of righteousness where you pray, God, please help me to overcome this. And you get the help. That won't get you to heaven. 
The kind of righteousness where you say, God, I'm sorry for my sins. I I really want to stop this. Help me. And you join with a church or a group of people. and You learn some basic principles of life and you start living good and walking right and and confessing your sins and you get baptized and you join a church, start reading your Bible and praying. That is a righteousness. Jesus said, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. That's not exceed in quantity. That's exceed in a certain quality, a certain kind of righteousness. You see, the righteousness they had, they were of the law blameless. Paul said he was. In his spiritual mind, he said, concerning the righteousness which was of the law, I was blameless. Paul said, not even God could find fault with my righteousness when I was a sinner, unsaved. God would look at me and say, this man is full of zeal and sincerity and he has served the laws of God fully. I see people today trying to play Jew, you know, Judaizers. Running around saying Yeshua and Yahweh and other things like that to try to, it's it's Yiddish, it's not even Hebrew, uh, trying to be Jewish and keeping the Sabbath and doing different things like that. You can do all of that, but it'll never get you into heaven. You can go down into a Baptist church, fill out a card, kneel at the altar, pray a sinner's prayer. Ask Jesus in your heart. Stand up, shed a few tears, get baptized, and start living the best you can with God's help. That righteousness will not get you into heaven. Paul said, be, be, be not be found in him having my own righteousness, which is of the law. That's God's law. But that which is through the faith of Jesus Christ. What does that mean, the faith of Jesus Christ? We're talking about you coming back into that faith relationship with Jesus Christ. Coming back into that place where you believe God. Where you have confidence in God. And where God sees that faith and calls it something it's not. Calls it much more than it is. Calls it righteousness. God gives us an example in Romans chapter 4 and 5. Abraham, the Bible said, believed God. What did Abraham believe? He believed that God was preparing for him a city And that God was going to give him a seed, a child, through his barren wife, Sarah. Abraham was 75 years old and still able to produce seed to have babies at 75. His wife, younger than him, was not able to have babies. Never had been. And God said, the two of you are going to produce a child who's going to be over a great nation. So God waited until Abraham was 99 years old. At 99, Abraham couldn't produce children any longer. He was just a dried up old prune. And here was Sarah, she'd never had any kids. And now the Bible said it was against hope that, that Abraham was faced with. Abraham was faced with a hopeless situation. And God met him and said, Abraham, I'm gonna bless you and you're gonna have a child through your wife, Sarah. And Abraham says, I believe that. I believe you'll do just exactly like you say. So Abraham says to his neighbors, I am the father of a great nation. Where's your kids, Abraham? Oh, I'm going to have one. That that old lady right over there, she's going to have, we're going to have a baby. Abraham, Abraham, you you know, you're getting a little senile, getting a little, no, God told me that that, that lady right there, we're going to have a baby. And so... A couple days later, Abraham looks at Sarah and said, hmm, you're looking good there, honey. She said, you're not looking bad yourself. He said, why don't we go in the tent and talk about it? They did. And they wrote it on a calendar. Because nine months later, a baby was born through Sarah. Supernaturally, God had healed both of them. Supernatural event. Now, Bible says that God saw Abraham's faith and called it righteousness. Abraham was called righteous for simply getting back into a faith relationship with God. 
Have you come back into a faith relationship or have you just got saved? See, a lot of people think getting saved is praying a sinner's prayer. They think it's asking Jesus in your heart or doing whatever else the evangelist tells you to do or having some crisis emotional experience. Really, getting saved is getting back the faith that, Abraham, that Adam lost. It's getting back into that faith, believing relationship where you trust God. And when you do, God takes his righteousness and imputes it to your account. Let me give you an illustration here. Let's go over to your file cabinet and let's look here. Let's go over to mine. We'll pull out Michael Pearl right here. It is okay. Here is a list of my sins. The Bible said the books will be opened and another book will be opened, which is the book of life. And the dead will be judged of those things which are written in the books. Here's the book of my sin right here. And probably God will also open Facebook to see what you've been saying on there. So the books will be opened and God will judge you according to the things written in the books. Now, your righteousness that you perform by God's help doesn't do one thing. It doesn't take away the old sins. The old record. It doesn't change what you did earlier. And for that, you are liable. So when, when the books are opened, will there be any sin in your record to your charge? I guarantee you there will. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It didn't say come short of a standard. We've come short of achieving that level of glory that we once had, that God created us to live in. We fell short of the glory. So that righteousness won't get you to heaven. That's your, that's your file cabinet. All right, let's, let's go over here to Jesus Christ. Let's open the file cabinet. Jesus Christ, the man Jesus. 33 and a half years. So we open it up, 33 and a half years. Kept the law, kept the law, kept the law. Obeyed, kind, generous, pure in heart, pure in heart. Righteous, wise, sinless. Never sinned. That's Jesus' record. <clears throat> Here's your record. <clears throat> now here you are down here on earth in your condition of sin. And God says, do you believe? You say, yes, I do, Lord. I believe with all my heart. God takes your sin, goes over to Jesus' file cabinet, and places your sin in Jesus' file cabinet. Takes Jesus' righteousness and goes over and puts it in yours. So if I were to die and go to heaven tonight and the books were opened, the angel would pull my file cabinet open and pull it out. And I don't want to be found in him having my own righteousness, which is the law, but that righteousness, which is through the faith of Jesus Christ. So God opens it up and it says... 33 and a half years of sinlessness. Perfect. Never lied. Never stole. Never cheated. This man is righteous through and through. That's the righteousness getting me to heaven. It's not what God does through me. It's what God did through Jesus Christ. You see, he took my place as a sinful son of man on the cross. So I could take his place as a sinless son of God in heaven. He took my place as a fallen man so I could take his place as the new man. He came to earth and went to hell so I could go to heaven. He became what I am so I could become what he is. He became a son of man so I could become a son of God. Jesus took my place so I could take his. So I now, God views me now when he looks at me as not, not in what I've done. You see... The things you think about me, all the books I've written, the people I've led to the Lord and, and all the things I've done, none of that counts. None of that's going to matter. It has no bearing whatsoever. God's looking for one thing when he looks at me. He's looking for Jesus Christ. He's looking to see if that righteousness of God is up on me because I am believing God through Jesus Christ. That's all he's looking at. Because my righteousness is like this and his righteousness is infinite. 
Mine is so weak and pathetic what I've done, who I am, compared to what I should be and could be, compared to what a perfect man is like. So I'm not getting into heaven on all my confessions and all my prayers and my baptism, my church membership, and all my books written, and 2,000 hours I spent in prison winning people to Christ, and hundreds of hours I spent on the street, and thousands of military guys I led to the Lord and baptized in the river. None of that God's looking at. That is something any idiot could do that could open his mouth and speak the message of Jesus Christ. And many have. Many have. So, I end where I started. Have you been born again? When, when, when there's a new birth, there's new life. And when there's new life, there's speech. Learning to speak. Now, you don't have to believe this, but my daughter got a baby less than a year old and when he was three days old he said what was it he said I love you because she'd been saying it to him in the womb in the womb in the womb in the womb and on three days old he said I love you didn't say it again for months but just right there on that first day he said I love you and so they prodded him with words words but he never said it again now my my sister when she was about four months old said cock a doodle do <laughs> in church everybody heard it she's facing backwards and us kids always say to her cock-a-doodle-doo cock-a-doodle-doo well she just stood up in church and said cock-a-doodle-doo the whole church heard it you know <clears throat> now when you when you have new life you start speaking the language you start praying to God you start speaking his name not because you're supposed to pray just because you want to talk to him because he's dear to you. You become conscious of him looking at you. You don't do hidden sins because there are no hidden sins. You're in a faith relationship. You have faith. He has faith in you. It's reestablished. You're walking by faith, not by sight. And so where there's new birth, there's new life, there's new language, new father, new master, new training, new growth, new living. And it's not all at once, but it's, it's this, this dramatic when a baby is born into the world. Dramatic. There it is for, in the world for the first time, a new life. Every bit as much alive as you are. <clears throat> Immature in every way. But when you get born again, it's a new life. And it's a real life. It's going to bud. Now, I am not going to invite you to pray a sinner's prayer because most of the people that do that are just sinners praying prayers. It means nothing. And I don't want you to go away thinking that you did what you're supposed to do and now you're a Christian. That's already happened to you probably. And I'm not going to invite you to come down the aisle and let us pray for you because salvation is not in you doing something. It's not in your response, some outward act or response. It's not in you to say, okay, now I'm going to get saved. This is the point. Okay, here I am. Save me. It doesn't happen like that. It happens when you start believing God in the work of Jesus Christ. So if in the process of you hearing what I've said tonight, you've believed God, you've, you've jumped out and grabbed that like a man drowning in the water, who sees a floating object and he grabs a hold of it and says, now I, I think I can make it. If you grab hold of this message of Jesus, grab hold of Jesus and say, I'm trusting him. I believe that he is the only way and I have no other hope. If you do that right now, if you've done that, if that's happened to you, then the spirit of God is going to give you confidence and assurance tonight. You're going to be aware of that peace and that presence of God, you have been born again. So it's just that simple. All right, I am done. I am through. <laughs>